John Stewart and his team of writers are truly brilliant at taking political subjects and making us laugh about it. Um, but even though we laughed, and so we wanted to pick this one on gerrymandering because it really does show how ludicrous what's going on with the gerrymandering is in this country. And even though we laugh at it, make no mistake about it, it's a very serious subject. Because whether this first panel talked about whether there's sometimes you can use gridlocking for positive results or is it negative and when is it negative, there is no doubt that gerrymandering is just negative because gerrymandering are political incumbents that are putting what's best for their self-interest and re-election over what's best for the people. They're, they're disenfranchising voters, they're reducing competition, they're rigging the system, and worse of all, they're contributing to our continued losing faith in our government. And that's one of the reasons why Arnold, when he was governor, with a coalition of remarkable leaders, fought so hard to end gerrymandering in California. And it's another reason that we're so glad, A, to be at USC, and B, to have access to remarkable academic scholars like Christian Gross to do research. So we have the data now, armed with the data, to go and help all these other states that are looking at what's happening in California and want to do this and other reforms in their state. So this will be very helpful to us. I want to thank you, Christian, for that that very much. Um, we're now about to enter the last conversation and uh, you know we've learned to try to keep everything under the time of like what a feature film would be. Our friends at the cinema school will appreciate that because it's kind of the average attention span that people are used to. Um, and um, this conversation is of leaders and national advocacy groups uh, and talking about the political reform movement in our country. So even though we're also going to talk about the reforms that have happened in California, we want to communicate to our USC community what else is going on, what's important, and the perspectives of some of these leaders. So now I'm going to be introducing our last panel conversation and our leaders. And rather than read their very long, remarkable bios, which you can look up in the program or online, uh, they probably all have their own Wikipedia page, um, I'm going to just give short introductions out of respect for hearing their perspective and having maximum time to have a conversation. So we're going to start by introducing Kathy Fang. Kathy Fang is the executive director of Common Cause California. Stood with Arnold and please go up. Stood with Arnold and 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 the coalition of groups in fighting for the redistricting reforms in California. Kathy's also a civil rights attorney, and we welcome you, Kathy. Next, join me in welcoming John Fortier. John Fortier is the director of the Bipartisan Policy Center Democracy Project. He's an expert in government and in electoral processes. He's written books, he's written papers, he's been involved in commissions and studies, and we're very lucky to have him here to share his ex expertise. Thank you, John. <laughs> Next, we welcome Dorothy Simon. Dorothy Simon is a vice president of policy for ARP. As an ARP member, having hit 50, they catch you, you all get their, their <laughs> letters to invite you to join. I'm particularly glad she's here. Uh, Dorothy handles all policy for ARP dealing with uh, citizens of America that are 50 years old or older, liaisons with their board, uh, and is very involved in all these different issues and policies, and we're very grateful to have you here, Dorothy. Thank you. And last but certainly not least is Jackie Salad. Jackie is the leader of the independent voter movement in this country. She is the president of independentvoter.org and author of Independent Rising, with probably the leading book on the, the growth of the independent movement in this country. And we're very grateful to have Jackie here. So welcome, Jackie. We see gerrymandering from Jon Stewart. We see how crazy that all is. We hear the first conversation. We see Christian's brilliant report on how uh, the combined two reforms, redistricting and the top two primary, are actually having some of the desired impacts that voters hoped, which is making uh, increasing moderation and reducing polarization between the parties. But uh, Kathy, you personally have passion for this topic and your own story, which I found very moving, um, and your organization is, this is an important topic to you. So I thought it would be helpful if you could share both your personal perspective and the organizational perspective to, for the audience to get a sense of, the, uh, of redistricting for you. Sure. Uh, in just leading up to the 2000 round of redistricting, um, I was a young attorney, and uh, I worked for a civil rights organization. Some of you may have heard of it, Asian Pacific American Legal Center. And uh, I was a young, naive attorney who actually thought that if you organized communities up and down the state uh, to present 
about what their communities were uh, to the Assembly and the, uh, the Senate, that they would listen, they would take that testimony into account, and they would draw lines that would respect where those communities were. Um, and, you know, we really organized, in some cases, hundreds of people to participate um, in that Assembly and Senate hearing process. Some of them uh, told stories that were heartbreaking. Um, here in Los Angeles, for instance, there was a group of Filipino-American veterans who talked about how, before they came to the United States, um, they had marched in the death march of Bataan, um, losing thousands of um, compatriots all on the promise that when they came to the United States, they would enjoy United States citizenship and be able to build a new community here. And the one thing that they asked of the Assembly and the Senate was they noticed that there was a district line that sliced Filipino town into two parts. It's a small little community just uh, around Hollywood, just north of Temple Boulevard, uh, for those of you who are Angelinos. And could we put those two pieces together? And I remember there were assembly members who were in that hearing who, whose eyes were tearing up just thinking about how so many people came to them with very heartfelt stories about uh, the importance of trying to hold those communities together. And in some cases, we were lucky. You had a good assembly person who heard that story and it wasn't against their interests and they followed the lines and they, they, they tried to protect those communities. But frankly, in most cases, once they went behind closed doors after four months of open hearings, what we realized was that it was all a dog and pony show, right? It was all really just for show because the legislators were going to draw those lines the way they needed to, to protect themselves. Um, I got a phone call from a particular senator from, from uh, San Francisco who called me up. I'm just a lowly attorney, right? Um, so it was pretty much an honor to get a phone call from a senator. Uh, and she said, you know what, Kathy? You're not going to put another fucking Asian in my district. 2000. 2000, okay? I thought black and white images, that was all a thing of the past, those civil rights battles, no. This is an ugly, ugly game where redistricting combines with racism, combines with power. And when people need to hold on to power, they will do what they need to do. And it doesn't matter whether they're Democrat or Republican or what the color of their skin is, they will do what they need to do. In this case, it was a white Democratic woman from San Francisco in an area that is one-third Asian where you cannot move a line without affecting another effing Asian, right? Big deal. So we saw this up and down the state, unfortunately. And, you know, when I came out of it, I basically realized this is a huge power play that was much bigger than I, but I was one angry woman. <laughs> and Governor Schwarzenegger, you said, you know, you got to fight for what you believe in. And so for the next Meh, five, six, seven years. I negotiated, thought we were negotiating with the legislature, and then finally we took the big leap of faith and we filed an initiative. And at the time, it was one of those build it and, and they will come because we had about $30,000 in the bank account, which is about um, uh, $3 million short <laughs> to gather signatures. <laughs> and you're just hoping and praying. But we had been talking to Governor Schwarzenegger all this time, and he believed in this as well. Um, and we, all the forces finally aligned, and a lot of people who we had been talking to in a large coalition, left, right, AARP, League of Women Voters, independent voters, business, civil rights groups, finally came together and said, you know what, it's time for us to get this done. And that's when we actually pushed through the sixth time was actually successful. And I also want to thank Bob Hertzberg, Speaker right. Hertzberg, because he was one of those valiant Democrats who dared to stand up when it was not fashionable for Democrats to say that they were supporting redistricting reform. He stood with us. And time and time again, we, we were able to say, this is not about a Democratic or a Republican power grab. This is about the people's power grab. So thank yeah. you. And, and Kathy, it's interesting you bring that up about Hertzie because uh, it ties back to the discussion earlier about courageous leaders, right? And for that coalition, there were a few Democrats and a few Republicans. I mean, Daryl Issa supported redistricting, uh, a, cons a conservative, a brutal, a, con a conservative Republican, both from the state and U.S. Congress, and Gray Davis and Hertzie on the Democrat side stood with the coalition and supported the redistricting. But Kathy's, Kathy shares, I mean, we could laugh about the John Stewart thing where you're seeing the district where, well, there's a problem because the blocks go through here, so we have to move it around there. But that, what, what she heard and shared with you about what a white Democrat senator said about not having another Asian in 
was protecting cell A at disenfranchised voters, but heaven forbid there are too many Asians in her district. She fears she'd be lose to an Asian Democrat right. that might choose to run against and the, her. And the arrogance. You know, and let's just put right. it out there. I think that there was a time when, once you were elected to that seat, you had a sense of ownership and privilege that this seat belonged to you until you died or you passed it on to your successor, that that district was for you to dispense with. And I think that in our democracy, we have a whole different definition of what it means to have people owning government, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not well, determined it's by... We people. the people, and that's what we're trying to make this all about. Um, I'm going to turn to Jackie now, because I think following this perspective of how gerrymandering disenfranchises voters, right? right? You have a perspective. You were a big supporter of the open primary. Yes. And you have a very interesting perspective. First of all, as people get more and more frustrated with government, state, and national government, more and more register independent, right? Yes. But beyond that, your perspective on disenfranchised independent voters with the open primary. So if you could address why open primary, which you supported, you came and was part of the coalition in California that supported that, give us your perspective on that, please. Well, basically, Bonnie, you're looking at a situation today where 42% of Americans identify themselves as independents. The registration rates in California are at about 20% and climbing, and I think the longer that you know we have the open primary system here, the more that number is going to go up because so many people register into parties simply because they want the right to vote in a primary. And so if you no longer condition participation in a primary upon being a member of a political party, I think this trend is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because What's happening in the country today is that more and more Americans feel that the parties are more deeply vested in their own preservation of political power, and the redistricting thing is just another version of that, right? Um, then they are in innovating, in increasing competition, in bringing new ideas to the political marketplace. They just simply want to maintain their hold on power. And more and more people feel frustrated with that. So when I began organizing independent voters, not as a third party, though I come out of the third party movement, I was very active in the Reform Party in the 1990s, and there we tried to effect a left-right coalition to bring people across the spectrum together to make structural change. But independents don't want to be in a third party, but they want to become organized and have a voice and be a force so that the, the process of coming up with policy is not completely determined through the partisan grid or through the ideological grid that comes along with that. And so the impact of the, of the California success has been huge. It's rolling out across the country in more than a dozen places right now. There are major battles going on with respect to the open primary question, and maybe we'll get to talk a yes, little bit Yes, we will when we, when we segue into discussing what the, the landscape of what's going on in the country. Yeah. But I'm going to follow up with another question that we didn't talk in our pre-discussions uh, in preparing. But it, it, you, when you talk about the rise of the independent voter and it's not a third party, it does bring up an interesting question that I have, and I don't know that you have the data on this, but that is, I mean, are independents left, right, both, centrist? Do we know where they are from an ideology perspective? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> they are all over the place from an ideological point of view. But what brings them together is a concern about the political process and a recognition which I think Governor Schwarzenegger really understands, that the outcomes at the policy level rest, the quality of the outcomes at the policy level rest very, very substantially on the quality of the process <laughs> that produces them. And part of what I, I found, just to give a short comment here, I found uh, the report that, that the Institute is releasing today very, very interesting, fascinating in a million different ways. The one twist that I would put on the results, perhaps, or maybe a slight difference in the characterization of the results, is that I don't think that you can actually say that this system produces more moderation, because what is, what's, what's coming to the surface in the first round, if you will, 
are the fissures that exist within the parties, the, 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 the battles within the Democratic Party that have been going on between more pro-business elements and more union-based elements, the battles that have been going on within the Republican Party among more conservative and more moderate forces, which end up being sort of tamped down under a closed system. When you remove those controls and you set up an open system, then those uh, conflicts come to the surface. And you, that's, I think, what you see. In a way, the, the first round is kind of a snapshot of that. But what that leaves out, because we're in the very early stages, is the impact that independents are going to have. Because independents have not been a part of those intra-party battles. They are a new force that's coming into existence. They don't respect and represent the same kinds of ideological categories. They want innovation. They want democracy. They want inclusion. <laughs> they want more competition of new ideas for solving problems. And so that is yet to come. And a lot of that turns on our capacity to organize independence. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really the big question that's on the mm -hmm. table today. How do we organize those independents, give them a voice, and bring them to the table? Because they're the ones that are going to shake up the mm -hmm. whole system. Thanks, Jackie. And I just want to say that Arnold always directed us, it was very important to him that we have data and research to back up the policy work that we're doing. And I know Christian joked that all scholars and researchers like to say, here's the more research that needs to be done. And we do plan on continuing it because to dig deeper, and like you say, in focus groups and such, to find out what, what the voters are thinking when they do this and continue to monitor the, the, the impact that these reforms continue to have is something that the Institute will stay involved in doing. I'm going to turn to you, John, on this and say that the a Bipartisan Policy Center has its own commission, and I don't think the report's out yet, but I know that you're looking into a variety of things, including open primaries and doing these things differently. So could you address your looking and your uh, and views on open primaries, including California's and some of the other things that the commission has looked at, your commission has looked into? Absolutely. And first, thank you for, for having us here. And thank you for, for a center that, that really is trying to marry uh, policy, research, and, and politics with the real world. I mean, I think it's very helpful uh, that we have all of those elements here. And I, I you know, have read Christian's report with, with great interest. Um, First of all, I think the, um, I want to stress how difficult I think the problem of polarization is in America. I think today, I'm glad people are optimistic, but I, I think that, that there are greater challenges than that we need to, to face. And so some of these reforms that you are trying here in California and other versions of them across the country are really important, uh, partly because you know, we have changed. And one, one way in which I'll mention we've changed, which I think is, is um, you know, that, that we're probably not going to go back to is that our parties, at least on a national level, were much more diverse uh, 30, 40 years ago. The Democratic Party had a strong conservative wing, especially in the South, with a lot of members uh, sitting in districts who would vote for Republican presidents. The Republican Party had a maybe a little bit smaller wing, but a, a smaller wing of R Rockefeller Republicans, if you want to oversimplify, of more moderate or liberal Republicans. There aren't so many of those today. We've kind of sorted ourselves out into districts. And that means all of these reforms are trying to deal with a, a situation where the people are a little more, the, the parties are a little bit more together. Yes, there are independents, and we can come to that. But I do think that there's, there is a great challenge. So we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't give up because the situation has changed from what it was, and we should think about reforms along these lines. Uh, two things, I guess the, both reforms, both redistricting and open primaries or, or ch changes to the primary system are things our commission is considering, as well as changes to Congress and other ways of making our world operate better, even though we are kind of a, a more polarized society than we were. Uh, we, think that, that we think that we should know more about California. It's new. It's having some interesting effects. Christian's report is showing some positive effects. But just that there are a variety of similar type reforms that probably are going to take a different form in, in, in a number of different states. Uh, think about redistricting. Uh, we certainly have commissions like California's and, and somewhat like Arizona's, which are more citizens' commissions. But we have a number of states that are looking into more commission, commissions that are more bipartisan, that, that invest both parties. Now, some people might not like them. They're, they're a little more incumbent-oriented. But they do, again, get away from what's, what's the great evil, I think, that one party has all the control and draws all the lines uh, to, to favor themselves. So you look at states like Washington State, um, something like New Jersey, states like Ohio, which are considering that. Uh, while it might not be exactly like California, it would still be a, a pretty significant move away from 
the actual politicians and one party dominating the others. Uh, we could also look at some other sort of secondary reforms like uh, ways of limiting the ways map makers draw the lines, whether it's uh, having strong geographic constraints of how you draw the parties. I actually know Kim Brace in the movie. He's a friend of mine. He's really not quite as bad a guy as he came out to be. Uh, but, but clearly, you know, there, there is the ability in many places to draw extremely creative lines. Now, uh, places like Iowa, but, which both have kind of an independent civil servant drawing the maps, but also have really strong constraints on, on how you draw the maps. It wasn't a surprise that they came out as, as rectangular as they did in the, in the map that they showed. So I think that there are a number of uh, reforms, both at the highest level, sort of moving to a commission of one sort or the other, or sort of secondary reforms to limit the map maker, whoever it is, uh, that, would, that would put us in a better position. Uh, second, if you look at the primary, the question of primaries, I think what you're doing here in California is, is very important. But we want to see how it works. And, and w one thing we want to get at, no matter what system you have, is uh, are we going to get more people actually showing up to primaries? Um, it's important to let independents vote in primaries. But it's also just the fact that we have very low turnout in primaries overall. Uh, it is not that much excitement. In an average congressional primary without a presidential year, it's, it's about 20% of the, of the eligible population might show up. And that doesn't even include the many states, or the number of states that have even smaller participatory systems like a convention or a caucus. My, does my does the average congressional primary have competition between two candidates that are viably competing for a spot? They, they don't always. So, so many, many places, in fact, there's, there's some that are uncontested, absolutely. Yeah. But, um, but, but you even have, my state of, uh, home state of Virginia has uh, a choice. The Republican Party decides, do we want a convention, which is three or, three or thousand or so people showing up at a convention and voting for a candidate, or do we have a, a, a primary that, that allows uh, a broader, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people to vote in, in a primary. Um, and that choice sometimes determines who the candidate is. Do you want to you keep the insider or perhaps keep the more conservative uh, candidate in place? I think the, the big message for us, we're the Bipartisan Policy Center, so we're not nonpartisan. We actually think the argument to the parties themselves is, is a good one, that you don't want, it's not in your interest as the Republican and Democratic Party to limit yourself to a small slice of voters, both because some of your regular voters are independents. The independents may be really heavily leaning towards one party or the other. The evidence shows that there are significant people who, who vote regularly one way or the other. Uh, and you're cutting them out of the process. You're cutting Please out various factions. <laughs> so, so you can look at this from a voter perspective, but I think it's also important to think from a, from a party perspective that it is in the interest of the political parties to find ways uh, to, to increase turnout, both from their perspective or state changes, like uh, uh, we're, we're considering something like a, a single day congressional primary to get more attention to it. Um, there's no one answer to this, but, but really thinking that we're only getting 20% of people showing up in the places that have primaries, uh, it's too low. And we need, we need a, a broader set of people participating, whether they're moderates, whether they're Tea Party, whether they're um, left or right. Uh, we don't let, allow enough people to participate in a, in, in a very important part of the stage, which then leads to the general. And John, I encourage you and your team to look at what we're going to look at. And it was highlighted by one of the great questions asked, and that is the, per the question that expressed frustration that when they used to go to the, to the voting booth in California, it was there's a D and there's an R, and they felt like, well, whoever we elect are going to go to their corners, you know? So um, we're going to look into when we say low voter turnout, you know, why, why does the current system make so few people, make so many people decide to stay home and not vote, okay? So I think that's going to be very important, and the Institute's going to look at that, and we'll keep working together on that. Let's go to Dorothy, and I guess my first question for you, since all these other groups are clearly directed at electoral and, and the voting process, ARP, you're about issues of, of importance to 50-plus-year-old voters. So one would say, why political reform? Well, basically because when we look at the issues that we care the most about, health security, retirement security, we don't think these can get done and resolved fairly unless we have a very strong democratic process that really maximizes who participates. So that's really the focus of what we're doing. We want to see our, our registration and our voting processes encourage as many people as possible to be involved because that's really how we're going to get the answers we need. And when you talk about low turnout in pri uh, primaries, 
generally, we have low turnout across the board. Against other countries, we have extremely low turnout. So we need to be looking at how to make registration and voting as seamless as possible and give broader access to do that. And the reason ARP is particularly interested in that is because for all the impediments that everyone faces to vote, older and disabled people, people who are caregivers, have all kinds of responsibilities, those issues fall particularly hard on them. They really can't get to the polls as easily, or if they do get to the polls, they are having more trouble in terms of getting inside and doing the things they need to do. So we have a unique interest in looking at our population and saying we want to maximize the ability of everyone to vote, but in particular, these impediments fall to our population. Can you be specific, I'll, I'll follow up and say, what are the big impediments to the population of elderly people in voting, and what are some of the solutions your organization sees to getting more elderly to vote? So I'm going to talk about three. That's certainly not the universe, but I'm going to illustrate three things. One is that our voting system in general has not kept up with technology and the ability to really do this in a more seamless way. There are some states experimenting with this, but we could have automated systems of voting that allow for online registration, that allow you to go in and register online. The current paper-based system is prone to errors, and the larger presidential commission, which I know someone is going to talk about a little bit more, also talks about this in terms of just the capacity to create a voting system that's much more seamless than it currently is and that allows not only uh, better security um, within the system, but allows people to really, once they give their information in one government office, it's really captured. If you move from one place to another in the state, you don't have to worry about your uh, voting registration somehow being lost and you have to re-register. Um, so all of those kinds of accessibility issues and seamlessness that, that can really happen for voters um, aren't yet, and it's too uneven in lots of places, and we have the technology to improve that. So we need to prioritize that. The second piece I would talk about is there's been a lot of progress about access at the polling places, but we still have more to do. There's still, there's been a GAO report in 2008 that talks about there's still too many voting places that have inaccessible ramps, the parking lot's hard to get to, they don't have curbside voting, people can't get to it. It just makes it really, really hard for people with any kind of mobility uh, issues to get in there and vote. And we need to do better at that and make sure we have accessibility for people with hearing impairments and the whole range of making uh, voting, again, simple and seamless as possible. For, for that one day, the voter really should be the king or queen in terms of allow people to exercise this right. It's a very important right. So those are two issues. The third uh, trend that's going on is the enactment of these voter ID laws. And the voter ID laws have been quite strict. There's about 19 states that um, have currently have voter ID laws. And this is saying you have to have a photo ID in order to vote. Well, for some of us, that doesn't sound so hard. You say, well, you know, you've got a driver's license. Why is this so hard? The issue is that it's getting the underlying documentation you need to get that ID. And for many, many older people, some of them born at home, some of them born in places that really didn't keep records, you have to go and get the underlying documentation. So even though the ID is free, the documentation to get that ID is a struggle to get. And then you start trending to the lower income populations. Do they have the transportation to get there? Can they take time off work to get there? So now you're creating more and more impediments for someone to vote. And the question we ask is, why do you need this? What do you tr what's the remedy that you're trying to, what's the problem that you're trying to remedy in doing this? And there really is very little evidence of fraud. The kind of fraud that, that um, voter ID takes care of is someone impersonating you to vote. There is very, very little evidence of that. And there's been challenges throughout the country in the courts on various grounds to try to overturn these because they really do fall much more harshly on older, disabled, and often minority populations who really can't take the time, they don't have the resources, or they just don't have the mobility to get there um, to get the underlying documentation. So we would really like to see voting again made the, the ability for people to exercise that right 
made as easy as possible and not layering on additional problems that really aren't solving an existing problem. We don't need impediments for, for a problem that really hasn't been established. And I just want to make one final point. Um, I did nursing home work for a long time. There are a lot of people living in nursing homes who are very, very cognitively well. They are folks who still should be able to exercise their vote. We should honor that. These are people at the end of their lives who've contributed a lot to this society. And there's a couple of states looking at mobile voting mm -hmm. um, where they bring the polling station to them. And it's very important, not only from a, uh, contributing to society, but really honoring the dignity of people who are still part of our society. So I just want to put a plug okay. in for that. We don't hear as much about that, but there really are a lot of folks in nursing homes who are perfectly capable, cognitively capable of voting, and they should be allowed to do that. All right, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to channel Arnold now for a minute, and you know this pushback's coming on one of the things you said, because in one of our briefings that Arnold participated in, um, you know, and I'll say this, because having been friends with Arnold for 30 years, he so loved coming to this country that when he became a citizen, I was there at a citizen party. He wore an American flag. He waved an American flag. He was like, you know, like it was like one of his greatest days. So to, to someone like that, Arnold says, or, and you, I'll let you speak for yourself, but it'll go, well, like, what's the big deal to get photo ID? <laughs> but I just have to share this for those USC people because you'll appreciate this. Arnold came to campus a couple of weeks ago, and we were having lunch at the University Club, and Kevin Starr joined us. And Kevin Starr, Democrat, state historian, Kevin's there, and I figured, I'm going to engage Kevin in this. He'll see it the way I do because it's disenfranchising poor and, and el elderly people, this right to a, a photo ID, you know. And Kevin says, well, because I'm elderly, Elderly, uh, and I have eye issues, I don't drive anymore. He goes, but, and then he whips out his photo ID non driver's license, goes, but I'm so proud to have this. And he goes, and I don't think it's that hard to do. So, of course, then Arnold and, and Kevin start in on that, and the two of them were big on access. I mean, Arnold was saying, let's have polling for 24 hours and let's do it at all the 24 hour gyms. And, you know, <laughs> but, but what's the big deal on photo? I mean, I get that. The, the research says that the amount of fraud really is overblown by the states that say we needed to prevent fraud. But what... But even to get the non-driver's the non license photo ID, you still have to come with some kind of documentation. That means your birth certificate. Many older people born in the South, born at home, don't have birth certificates. Then you have the conundrum, I don't have the birth certificate, I don't have the ID. I need the ID to get the birth certificate. So that still exists in places. It's ver it varies greatly in terms of how often these offices are open, how far away rural people are, and how much it costs. So for a person on limited income, if it costs 30 or $40 to get this photo ID, you're still asking them to pay to vote. And I think that's where the balance that you're striking is, how much burden are you putting on people and can you facilitate this further? Again, if, if you think there's a need for photo ID, you have to go back to what it's remedying. And there's no evidence or very, very little evidence that people are impersonating someone else in order to uh, vote. So for the people that it does affect, it's very harmful. For the large majority of people out there who've got driver's licenses who are young enough, they can handle it. It's not that big of a deal. But we're not bringing cases and we're not getting involved in this because there aren't a fair number of people in a whole range of states who are impacted by this. Arnold, I'll give you a chance later if you want to engage in this, but I want to use this as a chance to segue to, and I'm going to go back to you about the Presidential Commission, because I know it was one of the recommendations, and that's online registration using technology to decrease long lines at, at, uh, at, at some polling places, but also to register more voters. Kathy, you worked on this in California. Yeah. Would you share what's happening in California as a result of it? And then, John, I want to go to you to talk about that Presidential Commission recommendations. In a state like California... Oh, excuse me, and how do, also, how do we deal with the photo ID yeah. on their online registration issues? In, in a state like California, especially, you know, we are home to the Silicon Valley, you would think that online voter registration was a no-brainer, um, but even that was a pretty big fight. Uh, it took, you know, quite a few years to get us to that point. Um, but basically what it is is that, you know, before there was online voter registration, the only way to register to vote was that you had to go to a library or a post office and find one of those long forms and fill it out. And then for those of you who haven't heard of this thing, you had to find a stamp and put it on this 
this piece of paper and mail it back with all your information. Um, and you know, a lot of people ask, you know, look, I can renew my, my driver's license, I, I pay my bills, why can't I just register to vote online, provide some basic information um, and do it that way? Seamless, right? So we finally did that. By 2012's election um, in, in September, one month before the close of the deadline, we pushed and kicked and screamed until we finally got uh, the Secretary of State to create an online voter registration system where you could go online and before 11.59 of that um, deadline date, you could enter your information, your social security number, your driver's license, you know, some information that only you know um, and register to vote. And if you have a driver's license with a signature that you'd signed on a little VeriSign keypad, then it would import that signature over and you're done. Easy. A lot of people did it using their smartphones or you know from from their from the privacy of their own homes, um, and it was a real big push, purely by citizen-led efforts, because the government didn't have a whole lot of money to tell people about this. And here's what's amazing. It was only up for one month before the November 2012 elections. And in that one month, we got 800,000 new voters to register to vote. And of that, one third of them were under the age of 25. So if you want to ask whether or not young voters care about an election, that's your example. When you make it possible for them to register to vote easily, they come in huge numbers. And I think that with increasing changes, this is some, one of those changes that, frankly, is a bipartisan supported idea. We see secretaries of state throughout the US, whether they're Democrat or Republican, supporting this idea because it's a no-brainer. It's not about picking and choosing who you want to come to vote. It's about making it accessible and removing ridiculous barriers like trying to find a little piece of paper and you know mailing it back in when everybody's moved to the, the new technology age to be able to register to vote. And then once you're a legitimately registered to vote voter, you should have ease of access to the ballot. We'll, we'll talk about that, ways mm -hmm. that you can do that. Certainly in California, we're doing some interesting experimentation. In, in some counties, like Orange County, they have mobile voting. And they look at where, before election day, they look at where there are populations that need it, whether it's a senior citizen center or a, a campus, and they'll park that <laughs> mobile voting thing. Um, it's like, a, I guess, a in in long time ago, we used to have uh, mobile libraries. I remember that. But it was, it's like a van that's set up so yeah. that you can come in and vote. Um, and sometimes they'll even like hook up a concert right next to it so that young people Ooh, will come and participate. Really but they're getting really creative about how to bring people to places, or, or rather, let me take it back. It's not bringing people, it's meeting people where they are um, so that they can participate in um, voting, which I think a lot of people are excited to do. They just need to figure out. It's like Arnold's 24-hour gym idea. Let's uh, go where the let's, people let's are and let them make, get more people voting. But Kathy, thank you for reminding us once again that California leads in yeah, so many wonderful ways. But I'm going to go to John now because John was involved in working on the Presidential Bipartisan Election Commission that I believe Mitt Romney and Obama's lawyers co-chaired or something. And they just came out with their recommendations. So can you share with the audience what those are? Uh, th this commission was appointed by the president in uh, reaction to uh, especially election day lines that occurred in some places at, in the 2012 election. And he appointed his own lawyer, Bob Bauer, and um, Ben Ginsburg, who was Mitt Romney's lawyer. And this commission, I think, took a, a very practical look at our election administration system. Uh, and it's both a good model for finding a way to get things done across the aisle, but also really delving into the the nitty gritty. Uh, it had these two partisan election lawyers, but it had a number of election administrators, sec secretaries of state, local ad election administrators. They talked to a lot of administrators and found things that both parties could agree on that, that were just not working as well as they should in the voting process. Uh, one thing to step back, just realize how different America is than the rest of the world in two respects. One, we, we vote all the time. We vote many, many more times. We, you know the California ballot better than I do. It's long. There are lots of offices, lots of initiatives. There, there are primaries. There are special elections. Many countries you might vote once every three years for your one member of parliament or a, maybe a local election here and there, but mm. it's complicated. And two, it's decentralized. We have uh, different laws in every state. Uh, we also have many different election jurisdictions at the local level, 8,000 or so jurisdictions uh, are there uh, administering elections. 
So that's a real challenge to figure out how to make this whole thing work and, and, and change. So first of all, what types of things did they agree on? Uh, in the registration area, I think that's one where you know, there, there are broad views of both parties. If, if you want to oversimplify, the Democrats are, are most animated by questions of access, and Republicans worried more about the integrity of the system. Well, our registration system falls down on both. Uh, if you look at the, the registration system, where probably about 50 million people are not on lists who are probably eligible, and 25 to 30 million records that are wrong, inaccurate, uh, dead people left on the list, people who are, have their, you know, are on one state and, and another have their address incorrect. And both of those problems impact uh, people trying to get to the polls, but also potentially open up uh, room for fraud, where, where there are, you know, who knows who, who's casting a vote under some of these names that, that shouldn't be there. So there, there's lots of reasons to think about why you couldn't just improve both of those aspects. And so this commission uh, did make recommendations. One recommendation, online registration. Uh, I think does have a bipartisan support, partly because it is an access issue. It's easier for people to, to get on there. But also, it really does help uh, improve the accuracy of lists. Uh, when you put it on a piece of paper and you scribble your name down, and somebody else has to put it into the system. Uh, or you move. Uh, again, a simple thing like moving within a state now, I think things are, are getting better. But we're even, we have very difficult time telling whether you're in, registered in one state and another. And some of the other things the commission recommended were just greater efforts to use better big data, essentially, to, to go out and figure out, well, who, who are the people who are not registered? Can we, can we send them a letter? Or who are the people who are registered in two states? And there are some laws, the National Voter Registration uh, Act, which, which prevent you taking someone off uh, in, a, in a very simplest, simplistic way. But we don't want somebody still on the rolls in Oregon if they've moved to California. We want to, we want to get to them. So, I think both of these things get really get at, at these problems. Let me mention just a couple of other big big ticket items that the, that the commission recommended that maybe are below the radar screen, but are really important. One, uh, on the question of lines, uh, really recommended that no one should have to wait much more than half an hour. Uh, that's easier said than done, but there really are not many places, but in key, you know, small percentage of places, some extraordinarily long lines. We don't measure them. We don't. Uh, you know, really deal with how to, how to uh, allocate resources well to, to places. So that's, that's important. Two are voting machines. Uh, and in fact, Los Angeles County is actually a leader trying to figure out a new system of voting machines here. But broadly across the country, we have a crisis coming. We put some new voting machines in after 2000, the 2000 uh, Florida election and the Help America Vote Act early on in the, in the 2000s. Most of those machines are getting to the end of their life. They're not using up-to-date, off-the-shelf technology. We're not certifying machines. So we have a crisis coming. We don't want to say we're going to have Florida again. We don't have punch cards anymore. You won't see chads. But you may see some problems with machines breaking down unless mm -hmm. we start addressing this. So those, that's a flavor of some of the things that this commission addressed. And again, by addressing it in a, in a bipartisan way, getting at both of the concerns of access and integrity, staying away from some of the, the biggest uh, hot button issues, but also really getting into the administrator's world and saying, well, what's wrong with this as a system and what might we recommend is something I, I commend. Th thanks, John. In a minute, we're going to open it up if anyone has questions so you can get ready, but I'm going to tur turn to Jackie and then Kathy. Jackie, if you could give everyone a lay of the land of what states are looking at open primaries and then Kathy, sure. yeah. what, uh, talk about the states that are looking at redistricting. I know that uh, your counterpart in, in Illinois, Illinois. In Illinois uh, asked Arnold to do an op-ed, which they ran last week and you could fill us in on what's happening on the different states but let's start with uh, what's happening in the yeah, nation's open I, primaries. I'll, I'll give you kind of the highlights. There's really about a dozen states where there are you know uh, uh, live controversies or engagements around the issue of open primaries and nonpartisan elections and uh, I'll run I'll run through them for you quickly. I, I just want to say though that I gave John a little bit of a hard time earlier today. We were talking about the commission because independents came out all around the country to testify at these hearings that uh, the PCEA held and asked the commission to consider the particular barriers that independents face. So we had like a little bit of a tussle about that. I think it's, it's, it's an open question, shall we say, <laughs> in any event. OK, so here are the highlight, the battlegrounds, if you mm -hmm. will. And again, let me just restate the impact of what took place in California cannot be underestimated. It is just huge. It is motivating forces and people who took a shot, lost, were upset about the failure, and said, 
you know, got to walk away. It's making them reconsider the picture. And by the way, I love your philosophy about that. I wish everybody held to that. The number of times you have to go back and back and back to make these kinds of innovative approaches reality. It's huge. It's just huge. Arizona. We did an attempt in 2012. We lost. A uh, fascinating situation on the opposing side of open primaries, the League of Women Voters and Sheriff Joe Arpaio joined forces to try to knock <laughs> the thing off the ballot. So one of the beautiful things about this is that it scuttles the conventional yes. wisdom and the conventional alignments, and that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Uh, Colorado, a group of business leaders, um, uh, is looking at bringing something to the ballot in 2016. And part of what is interesting about that is that uh, they are trying to examine the question of what would it mean to build a new kind of coalition between the business community and traditional constituencies that the business community has not aligned with previously. So that, I think, is an important part of setting the stage. People are looking at that. What do you have to have in place? In California, we had an incredibly diverse coalition with all kinds of forces who were a part of it. That's a model that other states are looking at now. And that's as important, in my opinion, as the mechanics of whatever the solution might be. You want to hear an interesting story? One of the people who's involved in Colorado very deeply yeah. um, was the person who gave us that first $30,000 startup okay. and has, uh, for redistricting reform and then now has gone out to Colorado As to do that. So, to do this. so yeah. uh, you know, people, once they get it in their blood, you know, they, they keep fighting for these reforms. Yeah. Kind of neat. Yeah. No, that's... And, ja and Jackie and Kathy, with the short amount of time, just give us a kind of how many other states. And okay. um, we, we, those that you, you'll be here. So those of you that want more information on this afterwards can go check, you know, find out from Jackie. Okay, and, I'll, I'll do the short version. Okay. Hawaii, the Democratic Party tried to close open primaries. Uh, it ended up in court. The, the court, the federal court, ruled in favor of maintaining the open <laughs> primary system. Idaho, Republican Party <laughs> closed the primary. <laughs> we lost. And so the primaries were closed. In Montana, the Republicans put an initiative for open primaries on the ballot. The public employee unions have gone to court to try to take it off the ballot. In Nebraska, the Democratic Party just opened their primaries to independents. In Oregon, we're looking to see if there's going to be an initiative this year. Uh, Mark Fraunmeier is here from Oregon, who is yeah. the person who's driving yeah, that. Yeah, Mark. And uh, really, really, really wonderful leadership that you're providing there. Uh, South Carolina went to court. The Republicans tried to close it. We fought back. We won in South Carolina. That's the current status. The Republican Party has appealed. We're on our way up through the Court of Appeals. We'll see what happens there. Um, and then finally, just a, a, a new twist. Uh, in two weeks, in the state of New Jersey, a coalition of independents is going to court to ask a federal court to declare the closed primary unconstitutional on the basis of the idea that every voter should have full right to the access of the political process at every stage. And we're going to be asking the court to ban the state from funding closed primaries with taxpayer money if you are a private association and you are conducting private business under the protection of the First Amendment, fine. The taxpayers should not fund and finance that activity. And so that case, I think, is going to open up a whole yeah. can of worms. That's interesting. Question. That's great, Jackie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Kathy, and when Kathy's done, with the few minutes we have left, I thought we'd hear from Speaker Hertzberg a few moments on some of this topic. Mm -hmm. And then Governor will give you the last word on this before we close today's symposium. So Kathy, where's things at with, uh, with uh, redistricting in the nation? Yeah, so you know, here's the exciting thing. There are a lot of states that are looking at uh, California's success, but also the real breakdown in congressional politics, you know, in the gridlock that the first panel talked about. Um, so um, right off the bat, Illinois, um, and I want to just ask Ray Lopez Calderon to stand up. He is our um, Illinois Common Cause Chair. He's one of the folks who, if you think that there was corruption going on in California, Illinois has us beat, hands down. They know how to work a system. Um, so he's going up against the powers that be. Um, Indiana um, is pushing for a bill. Ohio um, 
big battleground state. They're also pushing, they've tried a couple times at the ballot, they're gonna try again. North Carolina is the state that people always hold up as the number one example of gerrymandered states. I, I think they focused on it a couple times in the Jon Stewart um, video. Um, they're pushing for a bill uh, to try to change the system. And then there's about 11 states um, that are in the making. They're building a groundswell of grassroots support. And that's really hard because as Governor Schwarzenegger pointed out, there's only 24 states that have an initiative process. So when you only have a handful who have an initiative process, the other route is to go through the legislature. And that is not an easy process because incumbents do not give their power up easily. That includes Delaware, Georgia, Maryland, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Texas, Virginia, Wisconsin, and uh, my good friends in New York. Um, but the, the big challenge is, it's about making sure that they put that power back in the hands of the people. And so whether it's the California model or the Iowa model or, or you know, some other system, the key thing is that they want to try to take that power away from the people who might be most self-interested in drawing those lines and give it to a group of people who will think much more about the testimony that's coming from regular folks like you and me. Thank you, Kathy. And before we go to Speaker Hertzberg, the panel in our getting ready to, to, to see what topics we're going to discuss and what's going on in the nation, Made a, wanted me to point out something, that everyone when we talk about uh, gridlock and corruption in politics, et cetera, talks about the influence of money in politics and campaign finance reform. And notice there wasn't a single discussion of that being on the horizon. And when, when I asked our leaders what that is, it's a combination of a few things. One, uh, it's they, the, the constitutional limitations, and the dean will appreciate this, and the citizen's case, makes the advocates for good government feel that their most effective way to spend their time is not in the campaign finance area right now because of Supreme Court and constitutional limitations. So they just wanted me to point that out because you, it, normally that's always part of a discussion on good government and that's the influence of money. Um, so with that, let's hear, let's, if, uh, Bob Hertzberg, if you could share. And then Governor, we'd love you to have the final words today. Three things, I wanna make three observations. Practical impact of the California model. First, the most dramatic impact was against the political industrial complex, political incumbency. It wasn't partisanship. Mm -hmm. When I got elected to government, my party was in the minority. Uh, when I was, was going into the speakership, I had 50 members out of 80 members of my party. And after redistricting, I only had 48 because I was so concerned. Different houses had different approaches about it being overturned. Redistricting created a supermajority in both houses. So the issue isn't partisanship. The issue is that it did not, it ignored where incumbents live that became, as I sat and had to do redistricting last time, everything was about where you live and where your enemies live and draw lines to avoid that. It was all personal, as Kathy suggested, all personal. personal relationships, personal protection, who you wanted, who you didn't, to make sure you were taken care of. Second, as I alluded to before, I think the bigger dynamic here is when you look at these races of who won and who lost, it really challenged fundamentally the architecture of leadership in Sacramento. I went and raised $46 million. I was one of those people, $26 million, excuse me, you know, for my people and gave them a ton of dough. And when I needed, to, when I needed a vote, I came and broke their legs and got a vote. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you do in these jobs. Uh, um, now, you know, whether it's the examples before, it's totally changed the dynamic where outside influences can, have, can fundamentally change that power structure. Hmm. But third, most importantly, is, is confidence in government. To me, all of this stuff of working together with people, it gives people confidence. It is an issue that so undermines folks' belief in government that you didn't hear a pipsqueak out of any of the noise, that there was a whole calm about confidence in government because of the elegance of this commission. And to me, that is the biggest deliverable in the process mm -hmm. because that's the stuff from which you make policy. If everybody's banging the drums and hates you, nothing gets done irrespective of your political views. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah. you, Hertz. And Governor? Perhaps you could take the podium and have the closing words of today's symposium. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much to the panel for the interesting discussion and also for having fought uh, for so many years in California to create the kind of reforms that we now have. And, um, you know, we have lost many times, and the biggest problem always has been uh, money. 
And uh, this is, of course, uh, where I came in very strong. We raised the last time uh, $30 million to get the initiative passed. So that Nancy Pelosi's $4 million that she threw at us and tried to derail us, or other people from a national office that tried to derail us were not successful. So we were successful in the end. And now what we have to do is just be a good example that it can be done. Now it is important that we go to other states and we work together. And, uh, you know, we don't always agree on everything because everyone has, you know, different uh, issues and different opinions about it. Uh, like with the voter registration, with the AARP, I don't agree with you, but I love working with you and all the other issues that we, we agree on. And there's many, many issues. And you guys are doing a terrific job. And I've been a member of yours for 16 <laughs> years. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, I mean, I said, that's just the way it is. So, I mean, again, I want to say thank you to all of you. I want to thank all of you uh, here. Uh, for participating. Bonnie, you've done a terrific job of putting this, uh, this panel together. And uh, I think that uh, we, there's so many states that are really looking to us for leadership, and we, uh, they know that the way the current system works is the politicians uh, choosing the voters versus the voters choosing the politicians. So it's uh, totally, you know, uh, upside down. And what we have done in California, we have corrected that problem, and now other states are ready to be corrected. So thank you very much. Thank you, all of you.